Ready? Uh, <laughs> hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, it's the first monthly meeting of the uh, Together Women Rise uh, seminars for 2023. I'm Renee Lash, member of Together Women Rise. Um, for some time now, I go to a group, a chapter in Arizona, and have so for about 10 years. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Betsy, and she is going to be doing half the program with me tonight. We're going to be sharing moderator. So before we get started, a couple of Zoom reminders. Keep yourself on mute when uh, we are having our guests and speakers presenting. There will be a question and answer period at the end. So if you put your questions in chat, uh, we will do our best to get to them when we can. Um, it's the start of the new year and a milestone for Together Women Rise. And 2023 is our 20th anniversary. We began in 2003, this very month, in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, thanks to collaboration of Marsha Wallace and Barb Collins. Um, in, 20, in 2002, Marsha read an article about women a group of friends got together and had potluck dinners and collected donations for the needy uh, using the money they would otherwise spend in restaurants. And on her birthday in 2003, she invited some friends over and asked, uh, including her neighbor, Barb Collins, uh, they were going to be celebrating, sharing a meal and donating the money that they would have spent in restaurants to charities supporting marginalized women affected, affected by war and conflict. The original birthday dinner led to the collaboration of Marsha and Barb and the funding of Together Women Rise, which was then known as Dining for Women. Uh, today we have hundreds of local chapters uh, who learn about gender equality issues, give uh, grants to organizations that support <clears throat> women and girls in low income countries, build community and connections with women around the world. Together, they've raised about $11 million in grants and partnerships and impacted the lives of 5 million people around the world. I was just back uh, from two weeks in Africa. That's why I have the cold. And I just got back yesterday so I hope my voice holds out, but I wanted to tell you that I, in fact, we did go to a cooperative that was run by women. It wasn't one that we had given money to, but these cooperatives, these were bead making ladies and jewelry making people, and they actually do wonderful work. So these partnerships, these grantees, uh, the possible grantees are all over the world and it's wonderful to see. Many of you uh, here tonight have been um, part of this wonderful, impressive history that we've made, and we thank you for support. Some of you uh, may be new to Together Women Rise, um, and we welcome you and invite you to join the community. And truly, we are making a difference in the world of women and girls. I encourage you to visit our website at togetherwomenrise.org for more info and ways to get involved. A milestone anniversary like this, a great time to celebrate and reflect on our accomplishments. And we definitely have plans to celebrate this year. Throughout 2023, there will be 20th anniversary events across the country. And a few of them uh, I can mention, but I'm sure Wendy is going to be perhaps adding to this list as we go through the uh, month. Greenville, South Carolina on January 15th, Santa Clara, California in March, Seneca Falls, New York, April 21st to 23rd, September 8th in Denver, September 30th in Chicago. Plans are also underway to have events in Philadelphia, Washington, DC, and my other home, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. These events are open to everyone, so please visit our website and sign on for them. I would like to right now turn to the first of our speakers. 
um, Nicole Miner. Each month, Together Women Rise features a project that addresses one of the many challenges faced by women and girls in low income, low income countries around the world. We award these projects a featured grant of between $35,000 and $50,000. And together at this monthly webinar and at chapters across the US, we learn about the country, the challenges and how the project will help uh, women and girls and global gender, uh, gender equality. This month we're participating with the Pangea, and I hope I said that right, um, a network, which is with the feature grants, and we will provide training and small business revolving funds to women living in extreme poverty in Kenya. I was just there, and yes, there is a great deal of poverty. Uh, this will lead to better health, right, uh, rights awareness, and more decision-making power, and greater earning potential. First, we're going to play a short video about the organization and the project. And then we will introduce our guest speaker. If you want to hit it, Wendy, we'll see what she says. Hi, Pangea's mission is to empower women and youth through access to education, training, and resources to live their best lives. I chose women because they are major, major catalysts for change in communities. And when you empower women, the family is impacted immediately, the children are impacted. Example, when one of our women has an increase in income, the first thing that happens is her children are in school. And so the ripple effect of a woman having um, health and nutrition education is her children now are eating better and they're eating healthier, more balanced meals. Um, and that's why women, women are our focus. The Kenyan Women's Network program focuses on women who live in extreme poverty, average eighth grade education, um, making less than $2 a day. And we basically work with groups of women, 25 women on average per group, and empower them through human rights education, leadership, basic business skills, bookkeeping, health and nutrition, reproductive health, and personal development. And they, once given the resources and the tools, um, can grow their business, and then we provide revolving funds to, to help that. To care about this means you just care about everybody living the best life they can, which makes everybody happier and healthier and, uh, and more responsible to each other. Tonight, we are pleased to have Nicole Miner as founder and the executive director of Pangea. Nicole believes the world, uh, that women in, uh, can be a powerful force to affect change through entire families and community. 
Nicole began her design programs in 2005 that have become the foundation for the Pangea Network. Prior to her formation of Pangea, Nicole performed market research for consulting and technology companies in Europe and the United States. Later in Brazil, she assisted a large international development agency during their in-country startup phase. Here, she found her passion for working with women and youth after seeing the impact that they can have on communities. Returning to the United States while working in the private investment sector, Nicole made the commitment to pursue her passion and began working and began partnering with local women in designing programs that could provide the greatest value to communities uh, involved. She enlisted a board of directors, filed for nonprofit status, <clears throat> and initiated the efforts which today benefit thousands of women and youth in Kenya and the U.S. Ms. Minor earned a master's degree in international management from Thunderbird American Graduate School for International Management in Glendale, Arizona in 1999 and a bachelor's degree in French from UCLA in 1994. She's joining us from the Woodlands, Texas, the headquarters of Pangea. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much. Um, I am I'm so humbled to be in this group. I mean, Together Women Rise is really amazing and congratulations on the anniversary. I just, I, I just think what you all do coming together like this, you really are making a difference and I, I just appreciate being part of it. So thank you. Um, I, you know, was asked to kind of share a couple of stories um, with you all and, you know, there, we focus obviously on poverty reduction. That's, you know, the main, the main part of what we do is to try to provide a, a road out of this cycle of poverty that, that persists generation after generation. And I, I think, um, one part of what we do, as was mentioned in the video, you know, we we focus on six months of upfront education with these groups of women before we even talk about providing microfinance, um, revolving funds, which is what we call them. And in those six months, we teach basic human rights and and leadership. What is a leader, a good leader? mean you know what um what's personal development talking about what are your talents and your skills a lot of the women that we work with have never asked themselves what they're good at because no one's ever told them they're good at anything no one's ever given them an opportunity to to even explore it and what's really interesting when we first started these these trainings and we'd ask women what are you what tell us a talent that you have. They couldn't come up with anything. They would usually end up saying having children. And, you know, you think about uh, just that opportunity to sit and say, wow, okay, I do provide this. I'm a good friend or I'm a good listener. Or, I'm, you know, a really savvy businesswoman. Um, and so you, you see over these six months, them start to stand up straighter, they use their voice differently. They're um, more confident in what you know they bring to the world, and that's really a big part of of what we do. And you know, it's harder to quantify the success of a human rights training. Um, but two very quick examples um, that are really powerful uh, in one of the communities that we work in on the coast. It's called the Shimoni. And when we first started working there, there had never been a female graduate high school in the district. And this was in 2000, this was 2011 or 12. So it wasn't that long ago. Um, and either the, the women in this, in this group, our first groups there, um, they didn't know 
that a female had a right to own property. They didn't know a lot of the basic rights that are offered them um, through the constitution uh, because no one had ever told them. And you know, Dorothy, who runs our office in Kenya, who is just a phenomenal leader and trainer, um, and our, our team, who's a 100% Kenyan team, who just does passionately um, these trainings all the time, you know, told them, you have a right to demand basic services, right? You're paying taxes, no matter how little you're paying, you're actually, you're paying taxes for basic services. And so Dorothy went to the local chief and said, you better get ready because these women are gonna come asking, or not asking, but actually demanding services. And, and they did. And since then, two maternity wards have been built in that district because there was not one in the entire district. And it's staffed with doctors. So the, I guess sometimes what we call the soft stuff is so, so important and, and can really change lives for, for not just the women in the program, but for the community at large. Um, so that, that's a really powerful example. Um, another related to, to the basic human rights training, you know, a lot of people that live in extreme poverty, as I'm sure you all know, don't believe that the justice system exists for them. They only believe that it exists for people with resources. And um, there was a woman who was in one of our very first cooperatives in Mombasa. And, and very sadly, her 11 year old daughter was raped. And this was after she had had the human rights training. And she came to our team and you know, also knowing what to do in that situation and to take her daughter immediately to a hospital and to have her tested and, and all of that. And they actually were able to go through the process and that man was put in prison. So for her being able to understand what to do that this is there for her, no matter how poor she is, um, and to see that kind of um, victory. I mean, it's all really unfortunate, but, but this man was actually put away, which might keep someone else from doing the same thing. Um, so those are two, two examples um, of, of success that's outside of you know, the, the basic business skills and the increase in income, which is really, really meaningful and powerful. Um, but I think that the, the other aspects of our training are equally important and just wanted to share, share those. Um, I don't know if, if people want to ask questions right now, or I don't want to keep talking. If <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll jump in here, uh, Nicole, because I, I encourage anyone who does have questions to put them in the chat, and I do already have one. Um, so um, uh, one of our members is asking if you could talk a bit about the community that you work in, um, you know, how it's rural agriculture. Do they, uh, the participants then graduate after six months and then they can apply for a loan or maybe talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Great question. So um, we, they commit to the six months of training and we work in both Nairobi informal settlements. So in the city of Nairobi in several of the informal settlements, um, slums um, in, in Nairobi. And then we also work in Western Kenya, which is uh, very rural agricultural, and then we work on the coast in um, Mombasa, as well as Shimoni, Wasini Island, um, which is a lot more remote. There's less farming there because the soil is not conducive to farming. Um, but fish fishing is a obviously a big thing. Tourism. Uh, and things like that. The women have businesses across 
uh, I mean, from tailoring to bead working, some of the, some of the women do that, um, selling vegetables, uh, everything from secondhand clothes, selling secondhand clothing to making soap and selling, um, starting little restaurants in, even if it's in an informal settlement, we'll make mandazis, which is like a donut, um, in Kenya and sell that. Um, so those are examples of businesses. And basically we walk through the six months of education and they have to, you know, they have a, a set amount that they need to save as a cooperative to kind of prove their seriousness. Um, and they set that amount. We don't set that for them, but, but they then, you know, we open a bank account so that they can start to save in a safe way, not under someone's mattress. Um, and, and then uh, after the six months, they do graduate, they get a certificate. It's a really beautiful moment for these women because a lot of them, it's the first time they've ever been celebrated for an accomplishment. And so that's a really wonderful thing to see. Um, and the village elders are there, usually the chiefs and the sub chiefs and the community comes together to celebrate them, which is really great. And then we go into the revolving fund um, portion. So um, we basically, you know, talk about what the process looks like and, and how we, um, we train them and how to keep the bookkeeping, which we've done already in training, but specifically for the, the revolving funds. Um, and then we usually distribute an average of about $3,500 to the group for 18 months. And then they can, if they are paying that back timely, then they can apply for a second round, usually at like one and a half times or two, two times that amount. Um, so I hope I answered all of those questions. That's great. Thank you. I'll, I'll move along because there's more coming in. Um, can you tell us the meaning of the name Pangea? Yes. So it's what they called the supercontinent when they were all one. And the idea that we are all one, it means all lands in Greek. Um, and we all deserve opportunity no matter where we are, where we're from. That's awesome. Now, um, someone is asking about your local team. Uh, what is the size of your team? And they're asking how much you pay the local team, um, I guess, just to get an idea of, of um, you know, the, the employment that you provide in that community. Sure. Um, so in Kenya, our office is in Nairobi, and we have seven full-time equivalent staff. Um, so five of those are, are full-time employees and we pay above average for that job, whatever that is. Um, and you know, it's still a lot cheaper than, uh, you know, employment here. Um, but for Kenya standards, it's, you know, above average in each of those areas. And then we have field officers where we actually um, have someone in the local community that goes to meetings and will follow up with the women's cooperatives or do business visits. Um, so we have one field officer in Western and then in April, we had one on the coast um, and she's no longer with us and we'll have a new one starting in April. It's awesome. A um, couple of questions here, which often comes up with our group about the men in the community and, you know, do they support the women's efforts? Um, um, is there any resistance? Are there any stories you can share about that? Yes, a uh, very good question. You know, we have only gone into communities that we're invited into. Um, and that makes a really big difference in terms of our reception in that community. And uh, so for that reason, I think that that's a big reason why we don't have any pushback from men, because one of the first meetings we have is with the village elders who are all men. And um, in every community. Um, so we sit with them and 
and share with them what we're doing. Um, and most of them, I'd say 95% are extremely supportive of the program and what we're doing. There are a few husbands that have gotten a little bent out of shape, um, at, but but that's you know maybe two out of fourteen hundred, uh, you know that. So so pretty good track record. And I think another big part of of our success in that area is that we don't go in saying this is what we're going to do. We actually have community meetings, not just with the village elders, but with the community to say. What are the major challenges here? Because even our local Kenyan team isn't local to that village or to that community. And so they need to understand what the challenges are in that specific community to know how to address them the right way. Sounds like you, you build a lot of buy-in um, right from the start. Yeah. I have one more question here. If anyone has any others, please put them in the chat. Um, actually, two more questions. First one is, how closely do you work with other groups or other women's organizations or women-led groups in the area? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we don't work that closely with other groups. Um, and I think that's something that we uh, would like to work on. Honestly, it's there's power in togetherness, obviously, with all we have, this is a perfect example. Um, and, you know, I think we do partner with, say, the, the local women's rep, right? So we'll work with her and we'll work with the people within her organization to get buy-in. Um, but we, we haven't really partnered with other organizations um, that I think could be helpful in terms of leveraging strengths and you know like for example rev the revolving fund portion maybe there's a way for us to partner with someone who's doing revolving funds so that our team is focused on the training you know there there are ways to partner that just create efficiencies um, that maybe don't exist right now so we're definitely um, looking at that so very good question hmm. And uh, the last question that I see in the chat, which is probably about our, our time for this Q&A, um, tell us a little bit about the consumers of the products and the goods that the women are, are making. So they're all locally driven uh, consumers. In the very beginning, we did have groups that were doing beadwork and we tried to market them. And then we realized that was really challenging because we had women selling charcoal and we're not helping market her charcoal, right? <laughs> so, um, so we learned pretty quickly that it wasn't, and maybe it wasn't the best uh, for our particular group to try to do that. So we, the women decide their business, most of them have a business already before we partner with them. Um, and they just expand that or do it maybe differently. Sometimes they'll go into a different business. Um, and, you know, it, so I, the, the answer, to answer your question, the consumers are all local, local consumers of their goods, whether it's soap or tailoring or um, food, agriculture, et cetera. Awesome. Well, um, I think we have covered all the questions in the chat and we are right on time. I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole, for all of your um, hard work. And we, uh, uh, together, Women Rise, totally support your, your cause. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to turn the next part of the program over to my colleague, Betsy Teutsch, and she will be covering a different set of issues. Thanks, Betsy. Well, thank you, Renee, and thank you, Nicole. Um, if you go to a chapter meeting this month, you'll learn more and you can sort of go in pre-prepped about Pangea. Um, tonight, for the next part of our program, we're gonna be kicking off a special feature that we'll have each month during our 20th anniversary year and kind of a throwback Thursday, it is Thursday, or where are they now segment where we'll look back on the impact that we've had over the years by highlighting one of our past grantees. 
we all have our favorites. Uh, tonight, we're looking back at One Heart Worldwide, and I'm just going to be calling it One Heart tonight, um, an organization that saves the lives and promotes the well-being of mothers and their newborns in underserved areas of Nepal, um, an extremely impoverished country. Our long history with One Heart began in 2006 when we funded 245 clean birth kits. Those are sanitary kits to help um, prevent infection for both mother and um, baby. Um, a very inexpensive innovation that saves many, many maternal lives and newborn lives. We funded them again in 2007 and in 08, and then awarded them a $50,000 featured grant in 2013 to fund the network of safety. This included health provider training, health facility improvements, and community outreach programs. In 2015, we uh, awarded One Heart a sustained grant of $75,000 over several years to train community health workers to be first responders for maternal and child care. So we're thrilled tonight to welcome Arlene Saman. Is Arlene back on? She said she was going to get back on at 8.30. Great. I'm so glad that worked out. And is Arlene actually in Nepal or in the United States? I'm not sure. No, I'm in the in Utah. Hi. Well, great. Thank you. Um, she began her career in Utah as a nurse practitioner at age 27, specializing in maternal and fetal medicine. In 1997, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, asked Arlene to serve mothers and their newborns in Tibet, where one in 10 newborns were dying of preventable causes. In 2004, she left her clinical practice to found One Heart. And while working in Tibet, Arlene co-developed the network of safety model, which brings life-saving care to expectant mothers and infants where the needs are the greatest. Um, in, the, um, in 2009, um, One Heart extended the model to remote villages in Nepal and the Copper Canyon of Mexico. Uh, One Heart has now arranged to construct and operate over 500 birthing centers in Nepal alone. Over the course of her work, Arlene has endured political uprisings, earthquakes, the SARS epidemic, uh, and in order to keep women safe, um, providing clean deliveries, touching the lives of hundreds and thousands of women to date. And I'm sure the pandemic uh, did not uh, miss hitting you too. Arlene has received many awards for her efforts. Most recently, she received the Global Thinkers Forum 2016 Award for Excellence in Women's Empowerment. Arlene and her team are hard at work to bring One Heart worldwide to scale in Nepal and globally. So thanks, Arlene, for joining us tonight, and welcome back to your old friend, Together Women Rise. Take it away. Yeah, well, I, I, one, am very honored to be here tonight. And I'm also shocked that that 17 years have gone by since you, you know, first started funding us. And I first learned about, um, at that time, uh, women dining for women. And I, I'm just, you know, like, where does the time go? Um, so thank you for all of the hard work that all of you have been doing. When I first met Marsha, I thought what a clever idea to have women donate what they would spend on lunch and pull the money and to really make a significant difference in people's lives. So um, congratulations to you for 20 strong years. Um, I, when I was looking back, I mean, you first started funding us, it was in Tibet. Um, and I remember that the idea of even putting a clean birth kit together was just like such a novel idea because we live, we were working in such remote, poor areas of Tibet where there were no resources. And so for us to put together a kit that had um, something clean for them to deliver on and gloves and scissors and razor blade and everything that you could use, but in, you know, very simple format. 
for a delivery out in a very, very remote area. And it was, people would get these birth kits, thanks to you, and they would actually put them on their altar until the time that they had gone into labor and then the, the local skilled birth attendant would come and use the birth kit. Cause I actually was caught out there one time and I had to deliver a woman with my bare hands. I didn't even have a pair of gloves. So that was sort of the start of thinking, oh my gosh, we have to put together these clean birth kits and we had somebody manufacture them. So you, you should be very proud that you were part of that initial uh, effort. Um, as many of you know, we had to leave Tibet in 2009 due to the political uprisings. And then we, we started over in Nepal in 2010-11. And even though at the time Tibet really was lacking a lot of resources, there were not electricity or very good roads or, or running water, getting to Nepal, we found that the challenges that faced women were even in some circumstances even greater because women lived on these mountain cliffs and um, many would have to walk over you know, 18,000 foot passes to get to a birthing center. So the idea of, of making sure that as many women as possible had access to a, a clean, safe birthing center was you know, like something that was very challenging in Nepal due to logistics. Just it's so mountainous and many places at that time, you know, sometimes still don't have electricity or running water or building supplies. And so the fact that we went from one birthing center to now over 560 birthing centers is like incredibly amazing. And bravo to our team on the ground that really makes that happen. And, you know, one of the grants that you gave us back at that one in 2015, 2018, at that time we were, we trained 5,154 community outreach providers. And I was just looking that now we've trained over 18,000 um, community uh, outreach workers. And so that's, you know, five times, more than five times of what happened when, when you first gave us a grant. So they're very busy. Our team of 68 in Nepal is just working around the clock. And and you're right. I mean, you know, you can add a COVID pandemic to the list of challenges that we've had to face. Um, the novel thing about our network of safety is that we put the mother at the center and then we make sure that there's a birthing center close by, that there's trained birth attendants nearby, that there's a, a hospital that can handle the complications nearby. And then we work side by side with the government and do not create a parallel system, but we work with them to help them reach their maternal and newborn um, goals for their country. And that has actually worked out really well for us to be a partner of the government. And we've been through a lot of changes because the government system was revamped and they went from top heavy down to um, community, um, the community itself, the municipalities are the ones that make decisions. They get the money from the government and then they fund the things that are necessary for their communities. Um, which is really great. And, but it was a little bit of a transition time for us to go through with that government change. And um, now we've even gotten the government to pay about 50% of the cost of our birthing centers. And, and they're picking up the cost of a lot of other things within our program. Um, by 2030, we will be in half of all the districts in Nepal which is a lot. And we will right now are reaching 369,155 pregnancies in our districts. Um, and each year in Nepal, there's about 700,000 deliveries a year. And by 20, 2030, we'll be reaching at least one third of those and the most remote difficult places. 
because a lot of deliveries take place in Kathmandu and we're we're doing some work in Kathmandu, but at a higher level, like helping them with their newborn intensive care unit or something like that. So when you asked, you know, what a difference it made, uh, it has been a game changer. I should say a life uh, saving, you know, at an exponential level of your commitment and what we've been able to achieve under really challenging circumstances. And I know there'll probably be a lot of questions. And so um, there, there are some questions already coming in. And, and can you elaborate a little bit more on, you know, the timing of, of our grants to One Heart and, and what that meant to you at, at the time and how it helped your organization maybe progress to the next step? Well, I mean, you started funding us back in 20, 2006, 2008, and One Heart was pretty brand new. Um, I don't remember what our budget was back then, but it was pretty small. And we were in Tibet where not very many people had the opportunity to work. So um, where we started working in Tibet and in the, in the two counties that we worked in, um, there were several years that went by that we had zero maternal deaths. Um, and prior to us coming there, it was one out of 100 women died in childbirth. And as you know, one in 10 babies. And by the time that we left, three, that had gone down 30%. So, you know, the, the real game changer, though, was that, you know, giving people a birthing kit. I mean, just something so simple, but was really changed the circumstances of, of how they delivered and had a clean environment to deliver in and not the husband taking his knife off of his belt where he's just cut the you know meat and then cutting the umbilical cord. So um yeah it was you know it's been it was a game changer. And then you know you fortunately followed us as we went to Nepal. And at and the, during that time, I mean, you right part of it was during the earthquake occurred in 2015, and um, two of the places that we were working in lost their their health infrastructure almost completely, and so we actually had to put up birthing tents um, that were donated to do deliveries in, um, and we were able to. Um, um, looking back, it said, you know, that we trained that 5,154 community outreach providers at that time. So it's awesome. Yeah. And I heard that you're, you had some team members recently finally get over to Nepal. Um, so I'd love we to hear did, about and that. And we later. have several that are going to be talking with us shortly. Just a few more questions that are, that are coming okay. in. Um, I, I think you talked about your plan of expansion to other geographic areas. Um, um, so I think that was addressed. But you said that, that the government is picking up some of the costs of the birthing centers. Do you mean the construction costs or the operating costs? Um, and I, I know our new CEO is on the call and our country rep from Nepal, but I believe it's the construction cost. Um, would either of you care to jump in on that? Hi, maybe I can step in this one. Yeah, this is Surya from Nepal. Yeah, it is a mostly construction cost. Great, thank you for that, and welcome, Surya. You're you are actually in Nepal joining us. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, the the next question is sort of, what did you do to get the government to pay their share, and and how do you fight? any corruption that you may encounter? Well, I'll let Surya answer part of that, but the way one of the ways we fight corrupt, corruption is to let them know off the, off the the right out of the gate that we, we usually don't give them money, that we are in control of the money and the services. So um, it, it's handled by our local on the ground team. Mm, Surya, okay. So, yeah, the first question about government share, you know, the government, uh, Arlene mentioned that Nepal went to the federal structure, you know, the it's very much like a decentralized uh, mindset now. So local municipality government has a 
autonomy to decide about whether where they want to use their resources and budgets. So we sit with them from the beginning, uh, you know, and talk to them from the project inception to the closing and discuss about, you know, what can be done. So we map out the needs uh, with the local community together and then ask them, you know, we are not here to just, you know, fund the project. We are here to partner with you and work together. Uh, so one of the you know major costs for one heart worldwide is the uh, birthing center construction that you know infrastructure is always expensive to build anywhere so we always ask them you know if you feel this is the right place to work we are happy to provide our technical assistance you know our you know team will come over and do, help you to do you know all the work but you need to uh, you know you need to contribute and uh, just a 50 percent fair share you know so we propose them, you know, this is a by community to the community. And then most places, I would say, uh, there is no real issue of, you know, coming out of 50% uh, budget sharing, some places more. And also, you know, we have recently, re you know, received the fund commitment from the provincial government as well, $100,000 worth of budget to be build a maternity what in one of the district where we have high delivery, but very poor infrastructure and hospital. Uh, so there is a lot of um, interest from the local community when we talk to them and inform them what should be the best healthcare look like. And they, they come easily and um, partner with us in terms of whatever resources they have. And about the corruption issue, you know, I think this is uh, all over the, I think, well, in you know, a very similar situation in this kind of, you know, countries, but uh, we, you know, we, we work with the government and we wait, you know, when things doesn't, you know, we talk to them, you know, we negotiate with them, you know, this money comes from the, you know, every individual donors from $1 to maybe 100, you know, so it is a, something that we have to report back to our donor, there is an audit process, so everything is very transparent you know we cannot just do anything uh, if you need something you know that is not acceptable for us sometimes we hold back for making some decisions some things get delayed but we consistently you know state you know like um, this is not possible and then we cannot we cannot compromise with our you know uh, integrity and you know our values and we have never had a such real issue so far um uh, in our project area and one of the things that have been very moving for me um is that often these decisions about how the money will be spent in the community where the birthing center will go and how to manage it are men within the community and so the men have really stepped up and started to take uh, more of an interest in making sure that their wives or their daughters have a, a safe delivery. And I, I find that, you know, like I remember in a meeting that Surya and I ran many years ago, and I asked the question, how many of you have a mother? And of course, everybody raised their hand. And then I said, imagine if your mother died in childbirth, what your life would have been like. And it, you could have heard a pen drop in the room. I mean, I had so many men coming up to me saying, what can we do? How can we help? We've even had men in communities donate their land um, and have offered you know, a lot of their services or made decisions for their community that all women needed to deliver in these birthing centers. Wow, that's, yeah. Yeah, I think that you, you, you put it so well to them. A um, Couple more questions. Do you provide prenatal or postnatal care? Yes, we do. So from the time that we know that somebody is pregnant, we are with them until several months postpartum and they can bring their babies back to the birthing centers for newborn care and their immunizations. And they can come back there too for family planning. So um, we are a resource within their community for women's health care. Awesome, awesome. All right, um, I think our time is about up for questions. I see someone um, telling us that they're going to Nepal with Rotary in November and wondering if they could visit and maybe I can connect them um, with your staff, Arlene, and, and they can talk directly with you about that. Um, but um, I, I um, am really excited about 
kicking off this special feature for our 20th anniversary year. And I think One Heart Worldwide was just a wonderful example of um, you know, the, the partnership that we've had with organizations like you, we are extremely honored to have worked with you, proud of everything that you've accomplished, glad that we could be a small part of it. And, and I hope that all of our members who, um, you know, maybe have been around for a while um, are, are also, that you should be very proud of, of um, the impact that, that you've had. So I'll turn it back over to our moderator, Betsy. Um, to, to thank you, Arlene, and thank you. Well, I just want to say, wow, I think we're all just incredibly amazed um, that you have been able to accomplish what all you have. And thank you, Surya, and thank you, Arlene. We have a, a special treat tonight, a firsthand, several firsthand accounts of the work being done by One Heart last October. Together Women Rise hosted a trip to Nepal to visit some of our grantees, including One Heart, and several of the travelers are with us tonight to share their experiences in Nepal and the impact that Together Women Rise has had there. So I'm gonna turn it over to these travelers who are Christina Skepton, who is uh, in Lakewood Ranch, Florida, where she's starting a new chapter, Becky LaFountain, who is a chapter leader in Cedar Key, Florida, and Valerie Swansere, who um, is a hybrid. She's part of the Burlington, Vermont chapter, but she actually lives in Thailand. And if you look out her window, you can see that it's light there. So thank you for uh, coming out. I think, um, Wendy, we'll have Christina go first. Uh, that that's completely up to them. They've kind of planned okay, this. Okay, well, whatever they <laughs> plan, let's, let's hear yeah. what you, your experience was. I'm not sure how much we planned, but I know that we're all happy to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Skepton Hi. from Lakewood Ranch, Florida. First of all, I have to say, um, if you have never had a chance to go on one of these RISE trips to visit the grantee organizations, if you ever can your life will be better for it. It was awesome in the true sense of the word. And as someone who had already been participating in RISE meetings periodically over the past eight years, it, and was already in love with the organization, this ramped my appreciation for the organization exponentially. So it was incredibly powerful to actually see the money in action and meeting the real people. I think as far as one heart goes, when we first, we had two days with them, basically the first day we visited their home office in Kathmandu Valley. And, oh, well, there's pictures. <laughs> <laughs> um, we visited their office in Kathmandu Valley and they showed a slide which showed this incredibly sharp decline in maternal mortality rate between 2011 and 2019. And that instantly sold me on the power of One Heart Worldwide. The next day we went, and right now what you're looking at, we actually went to one of the birthing centers and this I'm sure blew all of us away. If you see at the bottom of that walking trail, you see cars, that's kind of the end of the road. And then you have to get out and walk up that very narrow, steep path to get to the birthing center. So just to know that that's where women were going to give birth, <laughs> I think in and of itself was kind of mind boggling. And to think they had to carry all the construction materials up there. Uh, the welcome, as you can see, the welcome we received was so warm, so friendly. There were so many people there. It was, it was such an honor. It was kind of embarrassing, really. That's, we, we, they treated us tr like celebrities. And I think that again showed the power of RISE, that how much what we're doing makes a difference. So I know I was just blown away. They fed us this fantastic meal and um, delicious meal. So many of the organizations did, as a matter of fact. What was kind of funny on a personal note here at One Heart, 
one of the things they offered at the beautiful lunch was a basket of these fantastic apples. And I grew up on those horrible bag apples, you know, the ones that are mealy and brown. And I always tell my mother, she, she is the reason why I don't like apples. So I actually texted a picture of the apple I was eating to her and my dad while I was sitting outside of the birthing center and said, if only you had fed us these kind of apples. Um, so I think I was just blown away by the, the people of the organization, just their commitment to women and community. I don't want to talk too much. I want to let Valerie and Becky share. So I will pass the baton to one of them. I'll go next, if it's okay with you, Valerie. Sure. I could reiterate everything that Christina said. The welcomes were wonderful. And I don't know if you can see what I have around my neck, but almost every place we went, they gave us a scarf. And I believe this is the one that we did get from One Heart. And um, again, um, RISE gives us wonderful videos and information before we see the, the videos every month. But going there and meeting the people and seeing how they live and how appreciative they are is is life-changing, as Christina had said. Um, when we did go to this particular site, I understand I, it was one of the easier ones to get to, and it still took us two hours by Jeep. They rented five Jeeps, and then we still had to walk up that trail. And we were all amazed, like, how do the you know pregnant women get up this trail? But um, you know, they're very appreciative to have it there. And you probably saw some of the women with a beautiful light blue and then dark blue trimmed um, saris or gowns or whatever. Um, they are the volunteers. And sometimes they have to walk up to three hours just to visit one of their mothers. And so that was very amazing to us. And I raised the question, do they get paid? And what we were told by that gentleman right there who is the director of the whole area, he said, oh, really not, it's mainly volunteer, volunteering. They do get their outfits and maybe if they have to do something special, those or training will be paid for, but it is, truly a volunteer job, but you could tell they just um, felt so good doing it. They felt like they were doing meaningful work, contributing to the community, and that was wonderful too. Um, before I turn it over to Valerie, one of our co-visitors was a physician herself, Rhonda Grissom, and she could not join us tonight but I have a quote from her and I think it's very meaningful since she was a physician. She says, I am very impressed with their standard of care and thoroughness. They are striving to use the very best practices in order to optimize outcomes for mothers and babies. I am also impressed with their use of recently acquired portable ultrasound equipment. This represents a significant increase in the level of care they are able to provide. They are clearly constantly striving to learn more and do more for their patients. It is evident to me that they have good medical guidance in the setup and the execution of their work. And again, we were all very impressed. There you do see uh, one of the birth attendants. Um, I think she was like the, the head one or midwife. And you see this chart, and I think Valerie wanted to talk a little bit about um, the charts and the teaching. So let me turn it over to you, Valerie. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I also, I wanted to say, uh, first of all, that I was very impressed with the, um, their policy of, of co-investing with the local government, because I think that's really effective in making the local people have a sense of ownership and a sense of pride in, in their operations. 
you know, to continue in a sustainable way. And one thing that I was impressed with was a little, very cost effective. Um, it was just a printed out poster that was red on one side and green on the other side. And you can probably see a picture of it in a minute. It, it was very simple and illustrated. There it is. There are the illustrations that show on the green side, all the good things that you should do to promote good health for the new mother and the baby. And on the red side, all the possible warning signs. And so it, they pointed out that they wanted to have it illustrated because some people, it might be like the grandmas, some of the older grandmas who didn't benefit from today's modern education might not even be literate. And so, but they could actually have this as a guide. So if they knew, oh, uh, you know, something is wrong, we can, we should con consult the, the health people. And so that's just, you know, a simple thing that they printed out and they gave to every family so people can look at it um, easily. So I was impressed with that and I was impressed with, yeah, the volunteers that, that they were um, very invested, you know, very, um, and they were young people and they had a lot of energy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so the facility was very modern, even in this quite remote place. Um, so it was very impressive. And one thing that <laughs> I think a lot of people might appreciate is that um, they do not even use any kind of um, anesthesia. They don't have like painkillers for the mothers because that was like considered above the budget or whatever. So that, I mean, that was kind of shocking to me. And that was also in one of the recent um, memos from One Heart that I got in the email. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. This shows the, um, the, remote, the um, mobile ultrasound. So it, that's really high tech and really, really useful. And they can carry it to the remote homes of these expecting mothers. So yeah, we were all very impressed. And if I could add, there were no patients there the day we went. They were closed because just the day before the government had declared a public holiday because uh, there was a gentleman, he was a cultural historian and polymath, um, and he had died and he had lived to 103. So it was a national holiday. And we found out that they have over 50 days a year of holidays and festivals. And one of my friends, did text me while I was there and said, is it true that they're the happiest people on earth? And I think with all those holidays and festivals, it, they are close to being. All right, I think we're ready to wrap up. Um, what an amazing trip you all had. Thanks for sharing your insights and um, observations. And um, we're just kind of, there with you. Um, we do have a trip coming to India, coming up to India in February, but it's full. So stay tuned for future trips, which are incredible experiences. Um, I'm going to be the wrapper up tonight, the closer. I want to remind you that we depend on all of your donations. Thank you for being generous. I know our annual fund has gone well, but we're starting a new year and each year, you know, the expenses are right back where they were. So um, we hope that you will visit our website, Together Women Rise, and support our mission. And you know that we have many different ways to contribute, many different methods. Um, and thank you also for contributing your time and attending us and learning more about us. Um, I want to tell you a bit about some upcoming events. Um, we're going to be having three um, open sessions called Community Conversations with our board and CEO. We have a wonderful, still new, because she hasn't been with us a year be, uh, yet, um, Beverly uh, Francis Gibson. And she will be available Monday, January 9th at 8. Wendy's putting up the um, dates. Uh, Tuesday, January 10th at 1 and Thursday, January 12th at 8 p.m. And there, these are all Eastern time. And um, we will have board members at each of these sessions too. So lots of changes and exciting plans coming up. And these are um, 
really a kind of an informal way for our members to learn more about the directions that we're heading in, which are very exciting. Um, on Tuesday, January 17th at 8.30 p.m., um, our wonderful advocacy group will be having its kickoff for 2023, where we maybe we'll have a house functioning by then that we can lobby. Um, Leslie Heilig, who is out there somewhere on our call tonight, is a real has become an extremely accomplished. She's a retired doctor and an extremely accomplished advocate, and she has trained many of us. I see some of the people from advocacy here tonight, and we would love to welcome new members. It's a chance to be active in your state with your senators, your congressperson, the way that we can move the budget on a national level can complement the kind of results that we see on the ground. Um, our next uh, book club event will take place February 23rd. The book is um, The Kurdish Bike by Alicia Lightborn. That's also going right up there in chat. And she's an award winning author and a Together Women Rise member in California. So we're excited to feature her. Um, our next month's webinar is Thursday, February 2nd at 8 p.m. So we're the first, you see a pattern, we meet the first Thursday of the month. Um, and be sure to check our website for upcoming events. Uh, it's up there on the Join Us tab. And you can learn more, you can register and access recordings of past events. And we love, we wanna, we, we're going to be using um, Zooming as more outreach. So, because you don't have to go to a meeting, you don't have to leave your, you know, you can sit right in your pajamas and be engaged in the world. So we do encourage you all to invite friends to join us and share the, this wonderful good news. It's been great. We had, at one point we had 118 people tonight. So. And there were at least two sitting at one of the <laughs> one of the uh, windows. So we're thrilled to have you all. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you to all our speakers tonight and all of you who attended.